Nous sommes avec Martha Avrichko, spécialiste de la Shoah, depuis la Suisse où elle a trouvé refuge avec son fils après l'attaque russe. Martha, vous êtes directrice de l'Institut d'études interdisciplinaires au Mémorial de l'Holocauste de Babi War à Kif. Bonjour Martha. Hello, hello, nice to meet you. So Martha, why do you think it's so important for the Europeans not to be bystanders in this war? It's a very important question for me personally. I am a Holocaust scholar, and I know that we can teach our youth, our students, to recognize a language uh, of, of hate, to fight against racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, and other forms of discrimination and hate, and at the same time to be a bystanders and to just look at the tragedy that's unfolding right in our eyes. And um, the history of the Holocaust teach us that many people, they choose to turn their eyes and to look away. Even, even those who had resources to act, to fight, to help other people. And in these situations, those people became not bystanders, but complicit. They became even perpetrators and agents of violence. We observe that Russia nowadays enjoying this level of impunity. This is continuum of impunity after aggression uh, against Georgia in 2008, after occupation of Crimea, after occupation part of Donbass. Many people pretended that nothing happened, that they can um, continue their policy of appeasement like it was with Hitler before the World War II. And we observe the same nowadays. So all those people who are trying to make business as usual, not to bother uh, themselves with all these, you know, terrifying news, somehow nowadays are complicit in this huge tragedy that is unfolding in Europe. So I believe it's very, very important for all of us not to be a bystander, to take action, to raise our voices and to use our power to set an example for our children and to make our world more safe and full of justice. So if I understand well what you're saying, it's important to support the Ukrainian people because it's not a question of Ukrainian, Ukrainian democracy, but more broadly it's uh, about the democracy in Europe? Yes, for sure, indeed. What we observe now, uh, now in Russia is the rise of tyranny, is the rise of uh, autocracy, is the rise of, you know, lack of democracy in general, is a brutal violation of human rights. We observe that Russian regimes, sometimes they even don't let their women and men, their people to mourn, to, to protest, to express their free will, to express their free thoughts. And it, it's very, very important to stop this, to help Russia turn into democracy. And Ukraine people are willing to contribute to these joint efforts to make Russia democratic state because it's a question not only of security of Ukraine, but basically security of the entire world. Russia nowadays is undermining the whole concept of world security. And it's very, very important to face this together. But what, what do you say to the people who say that uh, it could, the, the war in Ukraine and giving more arms to Ukrainians could lead to a nuclear war and we have to listen to the Putin's demands? I believe it's a wrong idea because what we know from uh, Putin's policy in previous year, we can't just let him to do what he wants because he's going further and further. Uh, you know, some people even in Ukraine, uh, sometimes they express this idea, okay, maybe we just let let him take Donbass, Crimea, and the war will stop and suffering will, will stop. 
It's the wrong idea. Putin will never stop because Putin and his inner circle belong to the people who really believe that Soviet Union should be restored. He claimed that the collapse of Soviet Union was the biggest strategy. And for him, it's the aim of his life to restore this great empire, basically where Russia will be in the center. So we can't let him do that because after Ukraine, will be Poland, after Ukraine will be, you know, Latvia, uh, Lithuania, Estonia and other states. And this fear in these countries is very present because they remember this period of Soviet occupation. They remember this period of fear, repressions and uh, basically death. And Ukrainians have this long, long history of, of, you know, of struggle with Russian imperialism and what we need now to support Ukraine's struggle for independence and to and to provide any means to to stop this aggression, to stop this, this evil. So you're a historian of Holocaust. How do, you, yes. how do you see, how do you react to the way Vladimir Putin is using uh, the, the history of the World War II? What we observe now from the very beginning of Putin's angry speech on the eve of 21st February, he's misusing uh, the history of the World War II and the Holocaust. Uh, it's a poor Holocaust distortion. We observe how they call all the Ukrainians Nazi collaborators, despite the fact that six or even seven million Ukrainians fought in the ranks of Red Army. Thousands of Ukrainian soldiers fought in Poland army and faced Nazi aggression in 1939. Ukraine, as other countries during the World War II, including France, has its own complicated past. I mean, this past is uh, connected to to the collaboration with Nazi, because Ukrainians really believe that Nazi could restore Ukraine independent state. But after the refusing to do that, many of Ukrainians they went uh, into partisan movement and they start to fight both against Nazis and then against Soviet regime. So when Putin is Uh, talking about the World War II and the victory in World War II, it's about stealing of joint victory. He's claiming that Russia would would uh, defeat Nazis uh, without Ukrainians, without Western support, but it's not true. And I believe it's very important nowadays during Holocaust education, during our teaching courses to explain people that claims about denazification, it's a poor distortion of history. It's a Uh, uh, we can't allow politicians to use a history of sufferings uh, in previous time to justificate another war crimes and to justificate another war. It's Uh, it's very important to understand and, and just stop it. We, um, I want to say that Lavrov, for example, he even used the claim that Russian people nowadays are similar to Jewish people. So it, it's poor and it was a huge outrage and protest from Israeli uh, side because it's a pure distortion of history. Russia is trying to pretend and portray them, uh, itself as a victim of, of, uh, of the West. But it's not true. Russia is an aggressor nowadays. It's a perpetrator who commits war crimes, crimes against humanity and wages genocidal war against Ukraine and threatens its neighbors in other, uh, in other countries. So you, you worked on the sexual violence used by the Soviet army during the Second World War, at the end of the Second World War in Ukraine. Uh, is there something, something peculiar in this new war? You know, uh, for decades after the Second World War, many historians, many anthropologists, many politicians, lawyers were trying to join uh, their efforts in order to combat sexual violence in war, in order to prevent sexual violence in war, to develop legislation, to to make 
the idea uh, of sexual violence as a war crime, a crime against humanity, very clear, and to punish it properly. And I, as a historian of the sexual violence during World War II, I really expected that um, during this war, we would not see the same patterns of violence, brutal, gun rape which accompanied with, you know, broken arms, was accompanied with brutal physical violence, with killing of people. But what we observe now uh, in Ukraine, so many children are raped, uh, some of them in front of their mothers. Many of those uh, rape, rapes and sexual crimes are committed in Bucha, for example, against nine-year-old, 11-year-old children. Some of them were killed afterwards. And I couldn't even imagine that what I was study and wrote about, I will observe today. Uh, and perpetrators would be those who claim that Ukrainians are their brothers. Uh, and um, uh, from those who claim that Ukraine and, and Russians are the one people. And it's very, uh, very important to learn. Uh, it's a powerful lesson for, for all of us that our efforts were not sufficient and we should take more actions to stop these mass sexual crimes and to help survivors and their family members. Thanks, Marta, for answering to Mediapart. Merci beaucoup, Marta. Mediapart.